Good evening. My name is Rachel Roberson and I'm the leader of Westminster City Council. And I'd like to welcome you to this online conference this evening on the COVID-19 vaccine. And we've built this as, have, as being an open discussion, which is so important because of the importance of reassuring our residents about the vaccine um, and making sure that you have the information and the facts that you need, but also that you can voice any concerns you have and any any other issues that you want to raise. Um, we're aware that there's been a number of uh, materials uh, circulating in Westminster and indeed across London, both in terms of, uh, of printed material, but also on social media. So it's really important that everyone has an opportunity to, to air any concerns this evening and get the information and the reassurance that you need. And this is so important. And the reason why we've done this this evening is because we know that some of the communities that have been particularly targeted by this material are the ones who are most at risk from the virus. And what is most concerning is that among our Black and Asian communities, the vaccine hesitancy or the refusal to have the vaccine is substantially higher than for the rest of the community. And that really concerns us because this is about safety. It's about the safety of our communities here in Westminster, but also across London. So that is why we need to make sure that everyone has the information that they need. And I was really uh, delighted a few weeks ago when I was talking to Lord Woolley about this and mentioning how concerned I was about the situation, uh, particularly in our Black and Asian communities in Westminster, that he immediately offered to, to do an event for us to, to try and, and reach out and reassure people. And Simon Woolley, as many of you will know, uh, founded Operation Black Vote 20 years ago and is one of the strongest voices in the black community in the country. So I was delighted that he was able to join us. Also on the committee this evening, we have uh, Professor Kevin Fenton, who is the Director of Public Health um, for London, um, Eddie Nestor, who, uh, once again, a very strong voice in the black community, uh, but also through his drive time show, hears many of the concerns from Londoners about the vaccine. So he hears uh, the, the concerns that people have. Uh, Dr. Sonia Ibrahim, uh, Abraham, sorry, who is um, uh, a, a, a member of the National Institute for Health Research and a leading uh, expert on vaccines. Um, and also because of course, this is all rooted in our communities. I'm delighted that we also have two local people uh, this evening, Dr. Sheila Yogi, who is a GP right here in the heart of Westminster in Pimlico, and also Serena Simon, who leads our BME uh, network here at Westminster City Council. So please do listen, do pass this on, do ask any questions. This is about making sure that we can provide the information and the forum for you to have that discussion and, and be able to, to, to seek the reassurance that we need. Now, I was going to say at this point that I was going to hand over to Lord Woolley. Unfortunately, um, as is the way sometimes with these uh, things, we're having a slight problem with the, uh, with the sound. So while we wait for him to be set up with the sound, I'm going to actually hand over to Professor Kevin Fenton and ask him to, to chair the early part of the session with the hope that Lord Woolley will join us very shortly. So uh, with that, at that point, um, Kevin, please, um, I'll hand over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Robotham, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this important conversation, for this important meeting of minds and of hearts around the pandemic and how we work together to continue to not only reduce rates of disease across our city, but how do we protect each other? How do we ensure that the new tools and technologies that we have, including vaccines, can be best used to help to end this epidemic? Now, as you've heard, I am the Public Health Director for London, and I've been in this role for the past year, and I have seen the impact and the toll of this pandemic on Londoners. More than 650,000 Londoners have been infected with COVID, and more than 14,500 of our fellow citizens or friends or family members or colleagues have died from this disease. We are not yet out of the woods and we're now in our third national lockdown to control this pandemic. This is serious and this is grave and the pressure on communities, on families, on people, on our businesses is severe. 
So now we are at an important point in this epidemic where we now have one of the most effective vaccines that has been developed for an infectious disease. And we now have an opportunity to use that vaccine to protect the most vulnerable, as well as to begin to think about new ways in which we should use the vaccination to help to reduce the inequalities which have been a feature of this pandemic since day one. And a key part of the conversation today is ensuring that we have a chance to talk about some of the issues that may be holding people back from getting their vaccines, uh, be becoming hesitant about getting vaccinated or encouraging their family members to be vaccinated. It's important that we have real conversations about this, uh, this, this reluctance, real conversation about why we may feel hesitant, why we may have concerns about safety, why we may have concerns about the long-term effects. But the good news is that we have a fantastic panel with us today that will talk about many of these issues and we're here to answer your questions. This evening, we hope to dispel the myths and misinformation that has been circulating regarding the vaccines and which are causing, in reality, so much damage. Because the reality still remains that the risk of becoming infected with COVID is way higher than any risk that you will have with any side effect of the vaccine. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and the challenges that you're facing and how we may work together to solve them this evening. Now, we've received a number of questions in the run-up to this event, so we'll be taking a mixture of the questions that we have already received, as well as questions that you're posting live uh, uh, during the event this evening. So please keep your questions coming in, and we'll be going to them as uh, we receive them and, and discussing them with our panel members. So, uh, to introduce the panel members to you, I'd like to first of all introduce Dr. Sonia Abraham, who is from the National Institute of Health Research, uh, the Clinical Research Network in North London. And Dr. Abraham is a medical doctor and clinical research scientist. And her vision is to make sure that all research is inclusive of all diverse communities. We also have Dr. Sheila Niogi, who joins us from the Maven Medical Practice in Pimlico, where she is a senior partner. We have Eddie Nestor, who is a Sony award-winning broadcaster, and as a presenter of BBC Radio London's Drive Time Show, he tackles the subjects affecting the lives of Londoners and tells the stories that matter to them most. And Serena Simon, who is a program director for Westminster City Council's Church Street Regeneration Programme and Chair of Westminster Council's BME Network. I see that Lord Woolley is now back with us. Um, and we, uh, I, I think Lord Woolley has been introduced and I'm going to see if he is able to take over the chairing at this point. Uh, yes, we can. can. You hear me? I can. I've made it to <laughs> last. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all. I, I, didn't think you were, I didn't think you were needed there. Professor yeah, Lyle, yeah. That brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, let, let, let me just say thank you all, and I'm sorry for the technical problems and the delay, but I've been very, very excited um, about this extremely important discussion. And uh, first of all, I, I, I want to say thank you to all our, all our guests here. Have you all been introduced? We have, yeah. We have. Okay, so let me just give you a very quick background to, to this discussion and why, why we're here. Look, we all know that COVID-19 has had a devastating impact uh, in London and uh, across the country and globally, but particularly to black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Um, in those early days when we saw the black and brown faces on our screens that had lost their lives to the disease, that our, that our hearts sunk, uh, and then as the months went on, that we saw that it was having an impact on so many levels, that we were more ill by this disease, we were dying in greater numbers, and the impact it was having uh, was really felt right across the country. Uh, fast forward now to the second wave, and we are still disproportionately impacted. I'm sure Professor Kevin Fenton will give us some information about that. But what's equally equally worrying right now is that now we have a number of vaccines that are coming uh, to to um, our doctor surgeries and in hospitals, and yet there's a great hesitancy amongst many 
in our communities. And uh, what this discussion is about is really to explore some of the fears uh, and lay bare some of the lies, um, myths, and uh, misinformation. And so in the next hour or so, uh, I want to put many of these questions to our distinguished panel because I want to see a greater uptake uh, in the vaccine because essentially we want to save lives. But I don't want to say to anybody on this Zoom, on this call, that you should take it. I want you to decide for yourselves, mm. but I want you to know the facts. So before we begin with the questions, what I would like to do is to invite Professor Kevin Fenton, who's become a friend over the past year because we've been on so many Zooms together, and he's, he's, a, he's a guru and a, a trusted voice in this space. Professor Fenton, could I ask you to give us really a, uh, I guess, a broad stroke on medically where we are, mm -hmm. how Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities are being impacted right now, and how that has changed from early March, April, uh, when this, uh, the, the horribleness of this disease was unfolding. Professor Fenton, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Lord Woolley. And again, everyone, good evening. So as I mentioned in my earlier opening comments, the COVID pandemic has had a severe impact on our city and indeed on our country. And I've already mentioned that we've lost more than 14,500 Londoners over the past 12 months to this disease. As Lord Woolley has said, the disease hasn't fallen equally on all of us in this city. We know from the first wave of the pandemic in the first uh, two quarters of last year that we began to see these disparities, these inequalities appearing with the disease as it uh, went across the country. Uh, those who are older, uh, especially those aged over 70, were more likely to have severe disease and to die from the disease. In the first wave, men were much more likely to be diagnosed and to uh, have severe disease and to die from the disease. And if you're in particular parts of the country, in London, in the Northwest, you were much more likely to be exposed to the virus and to have a severe outcome. And finally, we also saw in the first wave of the pandemic that ethnic minority groups, especially black groups and black Africans, black Caribbeans and South Asian groups across the country were more likely to be diagnosed, were more likely to have severe disease and to die from their infection. Now, we've been able to control the epidemic after the first wave and over the summer and most of the autumn, we managed to keep rates of disease relatively low in the city compared to other parts of the country. But as many of you know, uh, over the Christmas period, we saw a new variant, which was far more transmissible than the previous type of virus that was circulating. And that has really gone through the city very quickly. And we've seen rates skyrocket across the city. And with that increase has been a reintroduction and a widening of those inequalities. And I'm really sad to say that today, with the high rates of disease that we've seen in the second wave, South Asian communities in London have been severely affected in the second wave with more diagnoses and more death, followed by black communities and then white Londoners. So these inequalities are ingrained in this epidemic. And part of the conversation that we'll have this evening is to say, how do we get beyond this epidemic, ensuring that everybody who needs uh, the tools that they need to protect themselves has both the information and is motivated to act but also, what do we do together as a community to ensure that we tackle some of the factors which drive these inequalities? So whether it is around poor housing or overcrowded housing, whether it's about poverty, whether it's about the kinds of jobs that we do that place us at risk. I'm looking forward to your questions this evening thank on you. this. Thank, thank you very much. And I'd, I'd like now to bring in uh, Dr. Sonia Abrams, as another medical uh, expert. Um, the, no doubt you've been on the front line of this and uh, I, I'm sure that it's been an agonizing time at times. Could you give your perspective of what you've had to face on the front line uh, dealing with uh, uh, the COVID patients and that intensity, please? Um, 
Yes, so well, thank you, everybody. Um, so I uh, got a very privileged um, job in that I'm helping do research as well as um, giving care to patients, um, mainly patients who have autoimmune diseases. Um, and so what I sort of witnessed over the last year, um, again, with the first wave, is within healthcare, suddenly everything was closed to make room for COVID, um, which was absolutely right and essential. And we saw the devastation of communities um, and groups really affected by COVID. Um, and, you know, we were, we were getting reports of people um, not only being severely affected, but sadly deaf. And as the statistics started coming up, there seemed to be a differential in the um, ancestries and the heritages and the ethnicities of people that seem to be affected. And there are probably multiple causes of this, and we can go from biological reasons to environmental reasons. And it has been devastating. And then as we understood more and more about the disease, um, how it affected, who it affected, we, we began to learn how to help support these patients. But what it also allowed us to do is accelerate research into understanding the, the effects that this virus had, but also what we can do to prevent it. And here we are today with this acceleration of a preventative treatment. We always hear prevention is better than cure. And what we have is a positive um, opportunity and we are so lucky to be in Britain because we've had the first opportunity. We've had drugs that have been developed here, we have drugs that have been um, approved here and we've got this fantastic program of being rolled out um, and so there is now hope that we can be one of the first to overcome this um, thing. So of, what is your sense of the well-being of NHS staff, those, uh, those on, the, on the front line? Um, that that are really being impacted on this day-to-day -day, uh, intensity. What is your sense of feeling with that? Yeah, so, so people are being worn down. Um, there was the initial sort of adrenaline where everybody comes together and you manage, you know, acute emergency. But this has been going on a long time now. Um, colleagues have been lost, some of them forever. Colleagues have been impacted. And people are working hard. 24-7, um, I mean, the NHS is wonderful. We've always provided 24-7 care. Um, yes. But the amount of care that's needed now is way more than the actual workforce that there is out there to provide. So they're tired. Um, Thank you very much. And yeah, it's having a huge impact. Thank you very much, Dr. Abrams. I, I want to now call in my, my good friend and in many aspects, the voice of Black London. Um, with his daily BBC programme, uh, is lived and loved London for decades. He, he is the heartbeat of Black Britain in many ways. Eddie, that you've seen this, you've felt it, you've had many, many hours of conversations on your BBC programme. What is what has been your sense of what's unfolded in the last year and this roller coaster? You've seen the, the deaths, you've seen the vaccine come about, the optimism, and then this dip. What is your view, please? Well, good evening to you, uh, Simon. Good evening to you, Professor Fenton. I'll address you two first, because you, you're the two I've uh, debated with the most, and to members of the panel, uh, and also people watching at home. I'll try and be quick, because I'm minded people want to get as many questions in uh, as yeah. possible. You see, Professor, when I hear you talk about inequality, I do wonder about, unless I have mistaken, uh, there's no genetic reason why black people should be dying more. So we have to look at why that is, the jobs that they do, where they go to. Uh, every single health expert I have spoken to, including yourself, has told me the number one reason why people aren't complying to rules such as they are uh, is for fear of not being paid. So I'm talking about a security worker, the person who works in the shop, the cleaner, the types of jobs that people do have a big impact. And I turn to this because this is not medical, this is 
political. It's not made better, so far as I have been told on my BBC Radio London show, uh, by uh, the happenings at the minute uh, with the member for Saffron Walden who's the highest uh, ranking uh, minister, the equalities minister, who didn't appear on that cross-party video to try to get black people to go and have that vaccine. And when asked by one of the most promising uh, reporters we had, why weren't you on it, uh, has, been subject, has been subject to abuse uh, because so many uh, people have thought it was wrong. Now, I, I speak to this... I don't want to, sorry, Eddie, I don't want to get too political at this stage. I, 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 what, what I want to do yeah, is... This, hold on, hold on. Is you invited own... me on a type of debate. Everybody's been really nice. I haven't come on here to tell anybody to take any vaccine. I've come on here because I am. Uh, I have to walk down the street, which is what I tell you all the time. And if I come on here and I don't tell you what people are telling me, then there's no point in me being here. And I'm telling you that they are telling me, if you can't ask the government a question or a government minister a question pertaining to that which you want us to do as black people, then you're having the argument now about that, as opposed to people looking at the video and going, look, all these people from different parties working together. Then you are arguing against the very thing. If the main no. reason that people are not complying, people tell me that I'll do this one and then I'll stop, is because if they don't go to work, they will not get paid. No. Then how do we sit here? Because all of us are getting paid. All of us in this meeting here, we're getting paid. So how do we say to people, don't go, go and get yourself tested, get vaccinated? Because in this list of things that people have given me about why people are not taking it, the one thing that people tell me is not on here. You know what it is, Simon? Okay. Trust. Trust. Okay, I would hold that trust there because I do think trust is a monumental, or at least the lack of trust is a monumental obstacle for many black, Asian and minority ethnic communities taking up this vaccine. And I'm not going to shy away from that at all, Eddie, you know that. But what I do want to do is to set the scene and then come on to the more difficult stuff. I, I want to now turn to well, uh, Serena Simon. Why don't people trust it enough to taste it, to take it, well, isn't it? So we know, I, unless we ask ho that Hold that. Hold that thought. Let me let me turn to Serena Simons. Uh, you work for Westminster Council. We want to thank Westminster Council, the leader, and the and its uh, chief executive, Stuart, for getting this together so we can have this important discussion. Uh, that I've known you for a long time, Serena, and you have been wonderful in terms of bringing those pan-London discussions around COVID-19. Uh, and you've seen it ebb and flow, and here we are now uh, with this shocking impact that it's had on black asian and minority communities and now the hesitancy uh, what's your feeling from where you are you heard you you heard eddie nester almost you know getting very impassioned about let's cut to the chase what say you yeah thank you thank you simon and again um good evening to to everyone you know um eddie i i, I truly heard you because um it is about um, how the communities are feeling. Why are they not accessing or, or finding a way to access information? Like the, the, this is exactly what we need to, um, to, to, to be discussing. I think hearing from the community directly about the why. Why are communities hesitant? And the one thing I will say is being able to have a forum like this where community has posed questions to us, you know, we're not going to run away from those hard questions. Um, but but we need more. We need more opportunities for the community to be able to um, be free and open about their concerns without fear of being judged. You know, um, you know, my son has 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 challenged me <laughs> and has, uh, you know, and he, and he's and is hesitant. You know, um, and my thing is, a bit like Simon, I'm not here to tell people, take the vaccination. I'm here to say, listen, let's have the conversation. Right. Let's have okay. the conversation because well, otherwise before... we'll be sitting in silos, yeah, with our concerns and that's just not going to help anyone. Before I open it up, there's a plethora of questions uh, that want to be asked. I want to invite Dr. Sheila Yogi. Uh, she's a GP. Thank you for taking time out from your busy schedule. Uh, again, uh, like Professor Fenton and Dr. Abrams, you're on the front line. 
uh, and we know this has been tough. I mean, I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing there's there's going to be a need for some post-traumatic stress um, support for you in the medical profession. What's it like from where you're sitting? So thank you all for inviting me um, and thank you for those who are tuning in and listening. Um, it's been very challenging. We've all had to work in a different way. And I think for those of us who have digitalized, for me, it's always been about getting to know my patients, knowing my families here in Pimlico. Um, and understanding my community, which I do, I think, because I've been here long enough. Um, but it's also understanding the impact this has had on them. One of the things I was very aware of is as soon as we digitalized, that precluded an awful lot of our older Asian, older black people from accessing us. I have always... In our leader counselor will know, I've always had a walk-in policy at my practice. Um, for a long time and there used to be queues queues and queues outside which a lot of the residents didn't like but you know it was a way where people could get access um yeah. that all changed with covid because now we can't have people in crowds just coming in and getting seen so we've had to do telephone video whatever but we haven't actually closed our doors and i think this is what a lot of the public need to realize General practice is still there. You yeah. can access us and you can come in. We will get through this because what ticks my box is getting my patients feeling better, is not losing. I remember the very first patient I lost to COVID. It was from an ethnic minority. She was 54 years old. Mm. You know, and I'll never how did, forget how did you that. Feel? How did you feel? I, could, I, I was gutted. I was, yes, she was called before her time. Right. And this is what gets me, that so many of our people are being called before their time. And we don't understand the science as to why that is. We don't know the medical reason what there is. But, you know, after a really bleak year, now right. there is light. And, you know, I... What is the light, Dr. The light is the, the light. vaccine. So I have been walking, this will make you laugh, 15,000 steps every vaccination day. And as you can see, I am not no sylph. <laughs> you know, I like me curries. It's the way it is. Um, but I have been walking those 15,000 steps, getting vaccine to the vaccinators, checking people in, marshalling people. A, because it's good for me, but more, it's good for my people. It's good for the community. So tell me this, tell me this, Dr. Dr. Yoga, when they come in for the vaccine, uh, are you noticing anxiety? Are you noticing stress or uh, people can't wait? Get it in, get me safe. What, what's so what, it's what very you interesting that the really old white population queuing up yep. outside the door early. It's only now I'm beginning to see the ethnic minorities come in. I have spent a lot of time ringing them. I've had the vaccine, couldn't wait. Giving it to my parents-in-law, couldn't wait. You know, I've read the research, I've looked into it. I can't see, I don't understand why people are so scared. What makes us communities is what has caused our death. The fact that we okay. live in communities, we have our families yeah, wanna, with us. Thank you, Dr. Yoga. I want to dive in. Look, clearly, it's been intimated, and I, and I would concur that there's lots of um, uh, distrust. Uh, Eddie, why is there such distrust? Give us, paint us a picture why so many within our community are distrusting the authorities, the government, and some within our medical profession. They tell me that they've never been put first. Why are they being put first now? We know that more black women die in childbirth. We know mental health services disproportionately, particularly black men diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. We, we know that these things exist. And what they say to me, Lord Woolley, is, you know, you're coming to us now going, we know things have happened. We know there's been inequality, but you must trust us to take this vaccine. And people are going, well, through my whole life, it hasn't been like that. And 
you know, the best way you could help me is if we work from the point of view, and as I say, uh, this is something Professor Kevin Fenton said in when he came on to my show on BBC Radio London, uh, which is we have to help those. If you supported people, perhaps, who couldn't afford or didn't feel as though they could afford to get tested in case they tested positive, in case they had to take time off work because they're not like us going to get paid, then it would at least have shown the beginnings of a kind of we care about you, we think about you, we cherish you. And I, I think what the doctor said there is absolutely perfect because we will think that everybody has access perhaps to, to the internet and the like. With COVID, it's really difficult to get to, Lord Willie, the type of people that you're talking about here quite often, because they might not have that access. Professor Fenton, you did a report uh, last year that sought to better understand why Black, Asian and minority ethnic um, individuals were, were catching COVID and dying from it. Let's be honest, uh, and I'm not putting any blame on you personally, but it was a bit of a dog's dinner the way that it was it was um, laid bare in the public. There was a number of iterations. Do you think that it is that way that the government handled these reports that has also led to this distrust, this gap between you've got our best interest in at heart? Hmm. You know, I, I'm really not going to sort of revisit that last year because remember that report was is the first report that was done by government on inequalities in the pandemic and it's helped to shape policy and programs that we've implemented since. But issues that I'm hearing from Eddie, and I completely agree with Eddie on this, that there are long-standing historical issues that have disadvantaged communities which pre-existed the pandemic and which the pandemic has exacerbated. The pandemic has made some of these worse. There are also new things which have emerged over the last year, which have placed communities at greater disadvantage. And this is why this issue of building trust is so important. And how do we build trust? It's about having the conversations. It's about authentic listening. It's about actually making the change. And I think, Eddie, this is what you're speaking to, that if people are saying, here's what we need to protect ourselves and our communities, then we need to see those changes as well. And you know, the vaccine is one part of this. But remember, over the past year, we've also seen many other advances as well in terms of treatment and testing, isolation support. There's much more that we can do to get that support to communities. I am certainly committed to doing that in London. But we need to also think about how we, how we change this as well. We have a question from Colin E. Uh, it says, when will the data from the vaccine trials be published by the makers of the products? I mean, you know, we're in this global trial in, in many ways. Um, and uh, that there's been, it's been sanctioned, it said it's been safe. But when will the data be published? Does, does anybody on this call know? Dr. Abrams? So, so thank you. Um, so just to clarify, you know, a lot of the data has been published in, in peer-reviewed journals. So, uh, and perhaps I can just sort of share with um, the listeners that um, in terms of sort of phases of being able to come to market for, for a medication, including vaccines, you know, the first part is called phase one, and that's all to do with safety. And then as you go through to phase two and phase three, yeah. again, you're still looking for safety, but you're also looking for efficacy and efficacious. And after phase three, um, it's reviewed by the regulators and it's dependent on the geographies. And it's amazing that our regulator, the MHRA, reviewed the data and felt that it was appropriate. And you know, it's rigorously scientifically looked at to be able to issue this drug and give it an authorization to be let's be, um, let's, be let's be honest here with a, a drug of this nature surely ordinarily these drugs are tested over a number of years and so isn't it honest to tell public that ordinarily that would occur two two years maybe three years but this is an exception 
Um, that first, Kevin, yeah. is that, is, would that be fair to say? I think you bring up a fair point. I think um, what I like to say is that actually vaccines have gone back to the 17th, 18th century. They were created in England, Edward Jenner. Mm -hmm. And after the pandemic, I would really um, enthuse everybody to go and visit his home where he gave to his gardener's son the cowpox vaccine to combat smallpox. The so vaccines have been around for a very long time. Um, many vaccines have been developed. And if we think about smallpox, it was eradicated in the late 70s. I actually had a smallpox vaccine when I was born because it hadn't been quite eradicated. Vaccines have been around for a long time. In terms of the time it takes to develop um, both vaccines and drugs, it did take a long time. But that wasn't to do with necessarily um, issues related to acceleration for safety or, or, or accelerating things. It was really to do with stop gaps between reviews and regulators, um, getting people into the trials. Now, one of the things that have been a really big problem is clinical trials and trying to bring that evidence to allow us to um, license drugs. What's been amazing with COVID is that everybody, a lot of people have stumped up and said, I will be part of the trial. So that's allowed for a lot of the acceleration. So, so are, are, um, you saying, are you saying that, that everybody's fast forwarded it ra uh, and got involved and, and taken the trials rather than that it's been shockingly rushed and things have been left behind that ordinarily would, that would happen. Is that, is that right, Professor Fenton? And secondly, I want to ask you this. Eddie Nestor made a very uh, big point in regards to confronting the distrust. He said that many black people are saying, why are we first? The answer to that question, are we being put first in this trial period? Uh, and the second question about is thing, have things been so rushed that we are cutting corners? Mm. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Lord Willie. So um, as uh, you've heard, the process for developing a vaccine has been accelerated because of the scale of the pandemic and the challenges that we face. Resources have been put into the vaccine development, into the uh, development and clearance of the vaccine, manufacture of the vaccine, resources that far exceed anything we've seen before. And that has allowed multiple scientists in multiple countries to be working at the same time in developing the vaccine, and which is why we have so many new vaccines coming on stream now. And that's fantastic. But also remember that the, the process of regulating and, and approving the vaccine has also been changed in order to meet uh, that we have. So no corners have been cut, but we've been able to do things a lot faster because of the scale of the pandemic. Now, to your second question, which is, are black people being first on this? Uh, the government has been clear that the strategy is to move by age because age is the strongest determinant of your likelihood of having severe disease or dying from the disease. And so age, as well as people who are clinically vulnerable, are the things that are being prioritized in the first phase of the pandemic. Of black people over the age of 80 have said they don't want a vaccine, Professor. Well, well, that comes back to the issue of hesitancy. Uh, around the vaccine. But in terms of whether black people are being placed yeah, first, right. okay. yeah. I would say actually it's about the age that's being prioritized. Now, within the age categories, we all have a responsibility to ensure that every community is called and every community has a chance to take up the vaccine. And as you say, Eddie, we are seeing data now that suggests that in some of those cohorts, because people are reticent, because they have their concerns, we're not seeing the take up in some communities. And that's why we need to have this conversation this evening. But black people aren't being prioritized per se. The, the, the risk yeah, is about I, age. Yeah. Serena, I want to talk about the misinformation. Uh, there's videos going around and uh, social media messages uh, stating that um, somebody's going to put a particular uh, drug in this drug that's going to control us. And uh, what, what is what is your what are you hearing about some of the misinformation videos and half lies that are being often, Eddie? They would say that they're being targeted to Asian communities and African and Caribbean communities. Serena.
so we know. We can't we can't hear you. Eddie, do you want to jump yeah, in I on some of these? Um, I'm hoping you can hear me. I've had to change devices. Um, can, can we can't hear, hear you me? very well. We can't hear you very well. So I'm going to jump to Eddie. Ed, Eddie, the myths and half truths that are circulating within okay. within black communities. Well, myths and half truths circulate very well within a vacuum of mistrust, don't they? And and you know, there's a saying that you can't disprove a negative, and and that, and that's the problem, really. That you know, it, it, in the old days, I used to be an active where you go to what they call hard to reach communities, and you used to have to find new ways and develop new ideas of how to get them. And I would never disagree with the doctor because I'm not one, but many of the people that I listen to day in, day out don't feel lucky to live in Britain, uh, where we've got well over 100,000 deaths. I think 1,300 people died today, uh, where per capita it's one of the highest in the world. So when you want to think of something, in a negative way, then almost everything that happens compounds that which you already think. So just before I came on, I was having a conversation with a good friend. I say, you disbelieve those you don't trust and believe people that you don't know. And there are videos that are being produced very well, much better, I might say, than the one with the MPs, that look that look as though somebody's put time, care, effort, and I suggest that that might be part so of the government's strategy. Into who, WhatsApp. Who is it? Who is it that, that is so in such discord, um, Doctor Abrams? No, Simon. This is this isn't Russia trying to interfere in the American elections. These are people who don't believe. I don't trust in the government themselves. And what they want to do is to say to everybody, here, let me show you my evidence. You're making it sound like it's an outside force. It's not. It's, it's people who but are why... really slick with social media and doing it. But, but Professor Kenton, have you seen, have you seen this? There, there, there has been uh, these images where they've cut and pasted government uh, uh, logos and NHS logos and then put in a menu of lies underneath. M my question, my question to the panel is that who is sowing these lies amongst our communities and why? Dr. Abrams. Yes, I mean, I mean, it upsets me that this has occurred. Um, I don't think it's something that's just occurred for COVID. This is something which sadly is in human nature. And right. what's fascinating... But who's doing is it? Even, who is it? Uh, in, individuals or groups? I mean, there's always going to be the non-believers. The non-believers of whatever subject one brings up. Um, and here, there are the non-believers that, that vaccines don't work. I mean, this is pre-COVID. We know that the uptake in our communities was low mm. even before COVID for flu vaccines, for MMR, measles, yes, measles, mumps, rubella. So, I mean, one of the, my hopes is that going forward, these will also be righted as well, not just COVID, but COVID is our stimulus to get this righted. Um, there's who a question, are these people? There's a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go, go ahead. There's sorry. a question for the for the two doctors. Um, that how do we convince Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities? This is a question from Doru. That once we have the vaccine, we'll be protected. So there's quite a lot of research, which. You, nothing is 100% safe, and I'm not going to give the impression that it is. But the evidence that has already been collated from people on whom the trials has been done has shown that with the first dose, you get quite a lot of protection. And with the second dose, that goes out into the region of close to 85, 90, 95 percent. Now, no, right. nothing will protect you 100 percent. But that sort of protection with low circulating numbers mm -hmm. will stop you from dying. And this is, you, you know, you can die crossing the road from a bus, but you don't cross a road with your eyes shut. Right. You reduce your risk. 
And having the vaccine is going to reduce yes. your risk. Yes. And so it, this is another question for the this is another question for the medical profession. And let me bring you in, um, uh, Dr. Abrams. And and that is that what are the risks? What are the risks, the the side effects to people if they take this vaccine? Okay. So um so um, just going back to the point that nothing is 100% safe, but actually vaccines are probably safer than you going into a pharmacist and buying, say, aspirin or non steroidals because they have a whole host of side effects. In fact, you buy any right. tablet or over-the-counter medicine, you look at the sheets, there are hundreds of side effects on that. In terms of vaccines, they're probably one of the safest therapeutic or preventative um, medicines. Right. Um, in terms of side effects of vaccines, we know general side effects and they occur for the ones here as well. So when you have it, you may have local reactions around where you have the yep. injection, maybe a bit sore, you may get temperatures, you may get sort of a very mild, um, so when you get sort of mild viral infections, just very mild of those. Um, to date, there have been no serious adverse events apart from, and I know people are probably worried about this anaphylactic reactions. Now, you can get anaphylactic reactions to any drugs. We know of those, and that those of you who've had the vaccine, we ask people to sit for 15 minutes after they've had the vaccine to observe. And if you are high risk, or, and if you're concerned about any of your medical issues, when you go to have the vaccine, and yep. just talk because the people who are vaccinating have been given training to understand what the relative risks are or not. So, here's a question, like say, here's oh, a question for to interrupt. Here's a question for Professor yes. Clinton. Look, you've said that uh, we are, and I think correctly, more likely to catch it, overly exposed, and more likely to be severely ill and to die. If the government know this information, one of the one of the uh, the viewers has said, why are we not prioritized to be protected? Because mm -hmm. we're disproportionately overly exposed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's interesting because as we've been having this conversation, we've gone from why are black people at the front of the list? And then, you know, why are we not prioritized? See, it just goes to show just how varied mm -hmm. the opinions are in the community. But I go back to what I've said, that the strongest predictor of severe disease and dying from this disease is age, right? And that's why the government has started from the oldest and is moving down uh, across the age bands to ensure people are vaccinated. Now, within age cohorts, within those age groups, we want to ensure that everybody who is at risk gets the vaccine. So whether it's men who we know have a higher risk of dying than women should be getting it if they're over 70, 80, et cetera. If it's those living in particularly deprived areas and BME communities, if you're in that cohort, you should absolutely be taking up the vaccine. So, you know, we are prioritizing all communities, but we're starting by age in order to manage the doses and having the greatest impact on reducing death from the disease. Serena, you're dealing with... Please, Dr. Yogi. Dr. Yogi. Um, so, so and, and just to back up, I mean, I did, I mean, what we want is a vaccine answered. Um, our limitation, the amount, which is why we've had to prioritize our most vulnerable first and then work down. Um, so if there was a completely unlimited supply, anybody could have it. So sadly, we just have to ration short term um, and help our most vulnerable, which is only right. Mm -hmm. And what about helping out those on the front line? Uh, I had a, another another caller said, what about teachers? Uh, what about those that working in public transport? Uh, Serena, do you think they should be protected first or at least in a priority bracket? The, look, the thing is, and Eddie spoke about this, there's, 
you know, the kind of health uh, conditions that are leading to, you know, kind of the disproportionate impacts are caused by structural um, inequalities. It's about what type of jobs are uh, our communities in? How exposed are they to, you know, not, not just this virus, but actually, um, you know, kind of being on the front line, being in jobs where their employment is tenuous, you know, um, uh, p people in, 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 in the community that I serve in my regeneration program, they're saying to my staff, they're fearful of going to take a, a, a test to see whether they have the, um, whether they have COVID, because what's going to be the next step after that? If they're positive, are they going to lose uh, the tenuous employment that they have that's bringing food and money in? So, you know, I think, um, Sonia, you, you know, you said it, uh, th there's got to be some level of prioritisation, but also um, in terms of how we come out of this, yes, the vaccination, absolutely. But what then? What next? How do we, because unless we start to dismantle those inequalities that are, are, are leading to our communities being more overly impacted, you know, we're going to be revisiting this again and again. I can see a lot, of the panel, a lot of the panel nodding, nodding about this. Yeah. It's obvious, isn't it? Sonia, please. I'm convinced. So we have the health impact and then we have the potential economic impact. Economic impact is where governments, I mean, you know, there is the disability laws. I mean, nobody should be impacted because they tested positive for COVID from a law point of view. Absolutely not. I know. Let me just say this to the panel. Let me just say, me just say this to the panel. Uh, because Eddie, Eddie has said it is obvious, but let me, let me say this to the government, it isn't. Mm. That there, there are many in the government that have been saying that. Uh, well, no well, wonder they're some have been talking. Let me finish. Let me finish. Some have been talking about genetics, and uh, and others have been saying that it's our own ill health that we're overweight. It's our it's our lifestyle. What I want to do at this juncture is dispel some of those myths or or concerns. And I want to turn to Professor Fenton, first of all, because uh, you've been a stellar voice in, in this space. Uh, I guess, on what proportion would you put the um, social determinants mm -hmm. alongside, let's say, the genetic uh, uh, infrastructure of Black and Asian communities? Because I think it's important for our communities to know uh, that the balance between the two. Can you help? Sure. You know, one of the things we know, not only from COVID, but from other infectious diseases and more general health, is that access to high quality care really accounts for no more than 20 to 30 percent of what really drives health. And those social conditions where you live, where you work, your housing conditions, having people around you that love and support you, account for much greater impact on your health and well-being. And those same factors are important in driving your risk for acquiring COVID as well. And so the report that we did last year and the work that we're doing in London now continues to show that if we fail to address those social issues, we will continue, as Serena has said, to be in this loop of addressing problems with this pandemic and other pandemics. And, and so I think this is part of the conversation we need to have. Let's focus on the vaccine now, and let's also work uh, to, to be uh, advocating for and addressing those wider issues, because but they're going to be- Eddie said- to this. But as Eddie, Eddie said, part of the problem for getting people the vaccine is this lack of trust, because we cannot have an honest conversation about the social determinants that are impacted. Eddie, I, I, must speak, I don't need to speak for you. You speak for yourself. Well, I'm not speaking for myself uh, because I work for the BBC and clearly I don't have an opinion. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of those people who WhatsApp me, who message me, who call me on my radio show and who contact me now uh, on my other platform, which is a podcast called uh, No Joke, which is that here is an opportunity for the government to show goodwill by making look when you got somebody like marcus rashford who is a footballer who himself suffered who has to get the government to turn around twice in order to feed he's not feeding hungry black kids he's feeding 
all children, right? So it, what it makes it seem like is that there is not a willingness to engage in those who haven't been to private school, who weren't part of particular clubs. And uh, what I'm saying now is the doctor has talked about, you know, getting everybody on point to be, uh, I don't know, up for the vaccine, uh, to say, look, inject me, I'll be there, I'll do it. Uh, what about all the other diseases that kill far more people than COVID around the world? That means that, you know, like getting rid of those people on the streets of London or the homeless people, it means if the will is there, you can do it. And it is, through this conversation and others like it, a wonderful opportunity to go, yes, and if you don't, and black people don't take it, then it means that, and I don't know about viruses, there are three scientists on there, but what I do understand about them is we are likely to see localised outbreaks for quite some time to come. And, Dr. And Dr. That, Yogi, I mean, you're on the front line. Dr. Yogi, you're on the front line. that's my concern. Is, it, is, there pov- is, there, is there a poverty, is there a, you know, a poor people's penalty? Um, so to, I don't, to, I, I'd witnessing? like to... I would actually try and put a slightly different slant on this. I totally agree that the jobs that our communities have, the way in which they live, makes more predisposed to be in close communities and because it's a highly transmissible disease, much more likely to catch it. But we also have to remember that those communities, the families, the support we give each other within our communities, which are very, very unique to black and Asian minority communities, that multi-generational feel with grandparents being part of the family is a real benefit from our communities that actually other communities have much to learn from. The reason why it is so important to have the vaccine is that that is the richness of our communities, the fact that we're multi-generational. And so going back to these cohorts who are at risk, if you're old, you're at risk. It doesn't matter if you're black, Chinese, white, Asian, Indian, right. Pakistani. If you're old, you're at risk. So I don't so want my parents in law to get it. So what what you're what you're saying is that it isn't it isn't genetics, that it is if you are vulnerable and the biggest vulnerability is 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 age, age. and but I we think want you're also to you're, communities together. But, but what I'm understanding is what you're also saying is that part of the Black Asian and minority ethnic strength, which is intergenerational uh, families, can also be an element of weakness in this particular instance. Yes. So, and, and so uh, never, on, let, me, let me just let me just try and give this a summary and then see what see where we are. But what Eddie and all the others have also said that we mustn't lose sight of this, the 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 social determinants due to low pay and poverty that are exacerbating uh, this disease. Not least, as Serena said, because we are overly exposed to it. If you, as Eddie said before, and or, or Serena that you have to go to work because if you don't go to work on a zero hour contract, you're not yeah, being paid. I've got a number of more questions I want us to fly through. Uh, it's worrying to hear that pregnant women and kids are advised not to take the vaccine. What, why is this, Kevin? So I'm going to ask the doctors to respond to this because I know they've been doing more research. But again, this is an area where um, the trials were not done on pregnant women. Um, So as we now have the experience of the vaccine rolling out, it's the conversation between women who may be pregnant with their physicians on uh, getting that advice. But I know we have uh, clinicians and uh, GPs on the line who who will be able to speak. Let me take a number of those and then you can answer them together. There's another one that uh, Lizzie F has said, what would you say to people who are finding it difficult to balance conflicting NHS advice and advice from family, family and friends in other countries? Um, Dr. Abrams. Um, so, I mean, so to answer that question, um, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that the NHS is, is and standardised, and, and I'd worry if people are hearing different things um, from the NHS. Um, 
and what no i think they always say the palace in that that... between the nhs and friends and and uh, friends and family abroad so they're yeah. getting lots of mixed messages so how do they make sense of what they need to yeah and again it goes down to that point of trust doesn't it yeah. um the people their family and friends um and, you know and also our environment i mean what we have at a poverty point is that we're unique again in britain because we do have this glorious nature it doesn't mean that if you're the richest person or the poorest person you will have right. access to the same medicine to me that that's phenomenal um yeah. so i think what we need to change is people's beliefs medicine will be the best for them now it, to, going back to sort of geography and where things in different countries um i mean i see how to to wrestle that i mean what we go um and, I, and i'm i'm not that hackneyed expression we need to look science but i have to use this sorry um, we do have to look at the science and the objective okay. outputs and then no. come on to them. Well, I mean, I did say, I did say, if I may, Dr. Abrams, I did say that, um, that this balancing act between genetics and social determinants, that, uh, um, Dr. Yogi, that, that uh, African and Caribbeans are predisposed to sickle cell. Yes. And what difference might that make uh, with both the COVID-19 and the vaccine? So sickle cell patients are in a high risk, clinically vulnerable group. Their spleens often don't work. The spleen is the organ you need to help you with immunity. If they catch COVID, they can't oxygenate themselves. They will go into crises. It is a respiratory disease. Normal when sickle cell people get an, a cough, cold, chest infection, they feel the effects of that. It is yeah. absolutely crucial that they come first. They, they, they are in the high-risk groups. They are in the clinically vulnerable. Therefore, they are being called now. And right. going back to the previous point about friends and family abroad, ask yourself this. If you were living in this country when you had a sick child years ago, did you ring your friends up or did you go to the doctor or did you go to the local hospital? Who did you trust? Because right. we're the same people. Despite all this social media, which I don't do because I'm old, but despite all this social media and other stuff that you hear, you used to trust the NHS. We've all had children here. We've all managed people here. So please trust us. We really are trying to help you. Well, look, we're in the last 20 minutes. It's been a rich conversation and, and you've laid bare a lot of, um, uh, a lot of facts uh, for, for the viewers. Um, and as we come into the, the last uh, 20 minutes, uh, I was struck, Eddie, what you said very early on. You said that the government have an opportunity, an, op an opportunity I'm suggesting to do, to do a great, great things in this space. What would they be? I think so. I think that we sometimes, you know, when I hear people talk about countries, the reason that they compare countries is that you would obviously, if you were living in New Zealand and 25 people had died as opposed to uh, Britain where over 100,000 died, you would think about what they with it. And I understand geographically it's completely different. I, I understand that. I, I think that, you know, sometimes cheap is expensive and not, as I say, going back to Marcus Rashford, not paying that 10 million probably lost a lot of goodwill and a lot of faith. And I think that here is an opportunity, I am being told, to say, look, we will give uh, an amount of money if you prove to be positive to make sure that for the 10 days that you have to isolate, you will be okay. It would at least, I am being told by people like Professor Fenton, uh, go towards showing that I care about you. I care about what happens to you and I'm not going to leave you hanging. So here is an opportunity to begin to build that trust, which is right. why we're all here today. Talking about building trust, Professor Fenton, I mean, you've been our voice in the, in the NHS and uh, many on this table from our African, Caribbean 
and the Asian diaspora have been the bedrock of the NHS, and we're very proud of that. But the reality is, of course, many will also know of the 279 directors across the UK, only seven are from our communities. So how does the, 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 the jewel in the, the nation's crown, the NHS, build greater trust with the, our communities that have served this institution so well? Yeah, yeah, that's such a great question. And, you know, I think the NHS, uh, with the experience of COVID, has certainly, I have seen, been loud and clear about addressing and tackling inequalities. And uh, only last summer, last autumn, in a letter to all of the NHS leaders, the chief exec of the NHS laid out his vision for addressing inequalities, for the NHS working better with communities, and for the NHS to really focus on the health conditions which are driving inequalities. You know, I'm as impatient as anybody else is. I want to see more leaders like myself working across the system and helping to make policies and develop programs for communities. And I don't think it will take time. I think it will take the will. And I know that certainly in London, we have a very, very diverse leadership profile. My counterparts in the NHS are from BME communities as well. We can do this. And so it's the will that I think is needed now. But we are thank seeing you. change. But that change is too slow. Thank you. So, Serena, listen, oh, I, I see you. I see you. <laughs> I, I'm sorry that we lost you before. I do apologize that we lost you before. But you're the community voice. You're the community voice. And there is a deep worry. There's a question there that says, look, is there a danger that the focus on Black, Asian and minority communities vaccine hesitancy could be misinterpreted and result in blaming us again <laughs> for uh, being infected and dying in greater numbers? What, what say the voice of, uh, of uh, a voice, a critical voice of Black Britain? Look, those, those, um, the blame culture has already started. We know that. So, um, uh, because experience tells us that, that that will be the case. But we have to, we have to take the opportunity to voice our concerns in forums like this, where maybe, maybe one person tonight is tuned in, listening to this conversation, and one person tonight has gained some more information that they didn't have before this event. And maybe for one person, uh, the change can be uh, monumental. But Simon, just please indulge me just one moment, because Kevin, you, you touched on a subject that's very, very dear to me about leadership. And we have got an opportunity right now, like we've never seen before, not in my lifetime, I think, to truly change the future of our communities. But it's going to require, and I like that point, um, Kevin, that it's going to require will. And I would say it's, it requires wholesale change, courage, true commitment and financial investment. And we know that the impacts that have, um, you know, led to this disproportionate impact, we know that they're many and varied. So the solutions have to likewise, uh, you know, be across the board, employment, housing, education, health, all have a significant part to play. But unless we have ethnic diversity in our senior leadership around the decision-making tables, we yeah. will be, my children's, and my children's children will again be having these, these conversations. We've got to move from engaging our communities to involving and co-producing with our communities. COVID and last year showed us how communities can galvanize and come together and create, you know, absolutely anything out of nothing at all. We've got to work hand in hand with our communities be courageous, and we've got to do something different because, quite frankly, what we've been doing up until this point has got us where we are now, and we cannot return. The, the rebuilding from COVID cannot be going back to how it was for Black and Asian people uh, pre-COVID. So well, thank you, Kevin, say, for Serena, giving me that segue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad, Serena, that you're only in the, that leadership space. Uh, as I am you, Professor Fenton. I mean, we haven't got to be shy. I mean, my, my brother Eddie. I mean, he, he owns it. He, do, he wears it like a like a German no, street no, suit. No. The, B but, the but... BBC, the NHS, the Metropolitan Police. These are all state. This is me talking now, by the way. They're all state-owned institutions within which there are huge numbers of disparities. People.
schools at the earliest opportunities, lack of opportunities for promotion. So we can, because that's the state. That's not individual uh, kind of, you know, that's where we pay our tax money for people to be treated properly. And remember, the whole Black Lives Matter is happening at the same time. So we mustn't take uh, that think this thing is happening in some sort of vacuum. We are in a moment here. Well, look, if I can bring you back to the particular subject, um, which this is part of, but a but little bit focused now, because there are, there are tens of thousands of people that, who, are, who might still be hesitant and, and worried. And I, I guess I want to turn to you first, Dr. Yogi, because you, let's say a, uh, somebody like my mother or my auntie comes into your surgery and they're just a little bit worried about having this drug historical and present day anxiety what would you say to them what would i say is that first of all consider this as an instruction booklet for your body to be able to fight the disease that's all it is that's all of the vaccine is it's an instruction booklet. It's not a drug. It's not going to change you. It's just giving your body the instruction booklet so that it can fight the disease. You're going to, going to be the one doing the work. And that's that. really all it is. You know, and you can stop yourself, your friends from catching this awful disease and dying it's just an instruction booklet that's all it is you know you're not changing who you are you're not changing what you do that's all it is if i didn't believe in it i wouldn't have given it to my parents in law i wouldn't have given it to myself or had it given to my to me and i wouldn't have advised everybody i know i have family in india and i've told them queue up for it get it whatever because you will live if you have this. Whereas if you don't, you won't be able, to, you know, if you get this and your family gets it, mm -hmm. the, the outcomes speak for themselves. It is a tragic disease and it's just instruction booklet. You know, it's not going to change who you are. So please come forward and have the vaccine. Professor, and I'll Professor Benton. there myself. <laughs> I love that. I love that, Dr. Yogin. Thank you. Thank you for that impassioned uh, uh, voice. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Fe Dr. Professor Fenton, that I want you to look in the immediacy, the, the vaccine now, but also the infrastructure that could be, should be, if we make the plans for a service that better delivers. You, you've owned that leadership role. I'm giving you the keys to Downing Street. What would that change theory look like? No pressure. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever I say won't be held against me. I think, you know, just building on the themes from this evening, it's about leadership and diversity and inclusion. So we are at the table making decisions uh, about uh, the future. It's about the culture and the value that we place on the community's voice so that we truly have services that respond to community's needs. And it's about placing our investments, not just in the individual factors which drive disease, but really tackling some of the social and structural issues that we spoke about today. You know, we will never get beyond COVID or HIV or tuberculosis unless we both tackle the disease and the bugs that cause it, but also those social factors that drive it as well. So I think those are my, that's my manifesto for now. Well, I love that. I love the manifesto because it's overarching. Right. It's overarching. Right. And it, it, you've got one vote there, Eddie Nestor. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Dr. Abrams, we've got a couple of more the nuts and bolts questions that if you could answer quick fire. Um, will we have to take the vaccine every year like we do the flu vaccine, question one? Um, will the vaccine prevent us transmitting COVID to others? Question two. And volunteers with no previous medical qualifications will be, administ with it, will be administering some of these vaccines. How can they do it safely? Three questions, if I may, if you may. 
Thank you very Abrams. much. So start making making you uh, making you uh, earn your suffer. It's a, it's not easy, but let's give it a try. Yes, thank you. So so just reiterating the three questions. The three questions. The yes. first one. The first one is. I, I, is I lost that, you. No problem at all. Is that will the vaccine prevent transmitting COVID nineteen to others? One. Okay, so fantastic question. Um, and off, you know, up to the minute data show yes. Um, and this was actually reported in the last couple of days, and this is related to the AstraZeneca um, and Oxford vaccine. And, and they did the trial, which looked at both the efficacy, but also looking at the Okay. On swap. And that's I'm going to stop because, so because the the, the yeah, line oh, isn't wonderful. Go ahead. The other two yeah. the other two questions are: uh, Will we have to take this every year, like the flu vaccine? Don't know yet. <laughs> yes, and very good question. And, and sadly, what we're seeing is COVID is trying to advance. So, it is potentially likely that as the the vaccine, as as COVID mutates, may need to change it. Um, at the moment, the vaccines we have seem to protect the variants, which is fantastic. But sadly, Mother Nature and COVID may, so it may be that it's every year. But um, ask me next year and I can give you a definitive answer. Uh, this one for Dr. Yogi, if I may, that um, there's a lot of people now being charged to give the vaccination. Um, what guarantee can we have that they are fully trained so everybody who has been trained up to do the vaccination is being given both online training which has been verified by the nhs and then they are supervised so they're supervised by clinicians who are experienced while they get to do a few um, and once they've been supervised and signed off, then they can vaccinate. But there's always clinicians present. If anyone runs into any problems at any vaccination center, there are qualified clinicians present. Um, to be quite honest, it's not that hard. You know, okay. it's like- And what about this for a question? Um, in New Turkey. If, you know, I've, just if I've had, okay. If I've had COVID, do I need to have the vaccine? We are recommending that people have the vaccine even if you have had COVID. There is a time in which we're asking you to wait. So I think you have to be four weeks post a positive test before we give you the vaccine. But just having the disease itself will confer you some immunity, but not the same level of immunity as far as we know at the moment. Therefore, it's absolutely essential that for the people around you, your loved family, that you cannot then pick it up again and transmit it to someone else. So yes, please come forwards and have the vaccine when called. Thank you. We have four minutes left. I'm gonna go around the room just for some a 30 second uh, thought, if I, if, if I may. Um, so I want to come to you first, Dr. Dr. Abrams. I mean, it's to you, the 30 second uh, last thought for, I think there's over a thousand people on this call, which has really been tremendous. And uh, thank you for stay, staying with us. Um, what would you say to, to this group who will speak to many thousands of other people about the, the big takeaway theme from this COVID hesitancy discussion? Dr. Abrams. So I would say we're at a transformative period um, in getting over COVID and also going forward and, and addressing health on various things to make an impact now. Um, there are worries. I'm sorry, and I'm sorry Dr. Dr. Abrams, it's, it's to we're going to have to write it down in the chat because the line is very bad, unfortunately. Uh, Serena, 30 seconds, please. 
Okay, 30 seconds, always hard for me. Um, listen, our communities want to be safe. We know that. Um, let's make sure that we continue having spaces that is safe for our communities to ask questions, to become, you know, fully informed. Um, and let's, you know, we don't want to see any more loss in our communities. So so, so let's, as professionals around the table, around health, uh, let's, let's provide those spaces. Let's not shame our communities. Let's enable conversations and let's kick this thing out of touch. Thank you. <laughs> Eddie Nesta. Well, <clears throat> barely a day goes by without me putting social media on and seeing somebody that I know who hasn't lost somebody. So this thing that we're talking about is real. 10 million people have now uh, been vaccinated. Uh, I just want to quote a, a friend of mine who rang the other day. He said, Eddie, I'm shallow. I'm advising people to get vaccinated and I'm going to get vaccinated because if I don't, I don't believe I'll ever be allowed to go on holiday again. <laughs> okay. That's the okay. I would say if a thousand people have listened in and you can tell a thousand more people yourselves all to get vaccinated, then we can actually do this and protect our communities faster than the COVID can get us. So please Thank you very just... Much. Go forward. To, to your answer, uh, Professor Fenton, where can people get information from? Uh, trusted information. Uh, so, uh, and your last thoughts. So my last thought is we have been through such a tough year, lockdown after lockdown, loss of family and friends. We need to put an end to this cycle and we need to ensure our community isn't left behind. I would encourage everybody to look at the information. Go to the coronavirus.gov.uk site. There's information on the vaccine, on data, how you protect yourself, and be part of protecting your family and protecting your community. Because I depend on you, and we depend on each other to get through this. I, I love that. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank the City of Westminster Council um, for helping to facilitate this and uh, showing leadership. I want to thank all my five guests for taking time out from being away from their families to be with us. They are with us because they care about you. And when I called them up and said, would they be here? They said, Simon, I'm there in a heartbeat because they want to impart this information that will keep you safe, keep you alive and put you in a position in which you can be with your loved ones sooner rather than later. But we know there's been historical disadvantage. We know that historical racial disadvantage is still with us today. We have to get over this. And then we have to, I know it's a cliche, but build back much, much better. I think the overriding thing for me from this meeting, from this discussion, is that we need to be around every single decision-making table that affects our lives whether it's in government, whether it's in the NHS, whether it's in the community. And when we are, everybody benefits. It's not a that we win, you lose. That we win, we, we all win. I think Professor Fenton has given you that, that pathway to get that advice and information that gives us the facts. But I hope, Serena, I mean, you've been a community champion on this pandemic conversation. Uh, and Eddie has said this too. The conversation that we're having this evening is one that we must have tomorrow, the next day, the next week, mm -hmm. and the next year. Because this is this is not a sprint. This is not, we're here today and gone. We're not talking about this tomorrow. We want to be talking about our future for a very long time to come. So can I thank you all, spread the word, get the information, get better informed, and be safe. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. to all our listeners. To all our all our listeners that engage, spread, spread, spread the word. Have a good evening. Go back to your families.